James chapter 4, verse 13. <clears throat> Go to now, ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain, whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for this text that's before us this evening. I ask, Lord, that you'll fill me with your spirit to preach your word. I pray that you'll minister to each heart through your word tonight, including mine, Lord. And I pray that you'll use this time to make us more like thee. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Please be seated. You must have heard it said a thousand times. Don't refrain, or no, don't, not don't. Refrain from calculating on the quality of juvenile poultry prior to the completion of the entire process of incubation. You've heard that said a thousand times, right? It's just a fancy way of saying, don't count your chickens before they hatch, okay? <laughs> You've heard that said a gazillion times. It's not that fancy way. I can't, I had to read it because I'm like, I tried to memorize it. I'm like, I can't say that. It's just too complicated. But don't say your count your chickens before they hatch. Because how often are we guilty of assuming what's going to happen next when we have no sweet clue, do we? We have no idea what the moral holds. We look at our circumstances. We make our plans based on that. We assume that we know exactly how it's going to go, and then we have to throw our plans out the window. Now, like tonight, we had plans. We were actually, well, it's a, actually a really complicated story, but we were going to go to, her Bethany was going to go to Walmart on the way here and pick up some groceries that she pre-ordered online. We have some groceries to put next door for the missionary, and then some groceries, there's two separate orders, the second one for our own, some, got some groceries for ourselves to pick up at Walmart on the way here. And uh, had this plan of how it was going to go. And then Walmart called this afternoon and said that they had to cancel our order because they had a fire in the store. And uh, apparently, uh, apparently they had to cancel out the, uh, their order because they weren't able to fill that order. So we weren't going to go to Walmart anymore, we made new plans. And then Bethany's realizing, I don't know what happened at that Walmart, but they only canceled one order. <laughs> and so I still have to go and pick up the other order, which wasn't the one that I wanted to pick up. But anyways, it's beside the point. But we make these plans, and then they all get changed, don't they? As someone said, God, or we propose, man proposes, but God disposes. And if there's ever been a lesson that we need to learn that we should have learned at the very least with the last few years and how planning has gone for all sorts of things, it's that we need to make our plans with this phrase, if the Lord wills, if the Lord wills. And that's exactly what James is trying to teach us in this text. In James 4, 13 to 17, we need to live our lives as the Lord wills. And so as we look at our text this evening, I just, this is like a record for me. I don't remember the last time we had this. Only two main points. So anyways, might be a little quicker tonight. I don't know. But I uh, couldn't come up with, I wasn't about to put stuff in there that wasn't there. So I had to stick with the two points. But the first one this evening is the senselessness of making plans without God. I know I had a much shorter word, but when I had to alliterate, I had to change it to senselessness. S-E-N-S-E-S, less, L-E-S-S, ness, N-E-S-S. -E -S. But it's just the idea of how silly it is to make our plans without God. The senselessness of making plans without God. You know how when your kids are doing something crazy and you have to say, hey, look here now, you listen up. Well, you know what the word go to now means? Look here, listen up. Time for you to pay attention. 
what you're doing is silly. It's senseless. It's foolish. Go to now. Ye that say today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. The senselessness of making plans without God. We see first of all here that, why is this plan so senseless? Well, first of all, because they forgot the Lord, the forgotten Lord in verse number 13. You read verse 13, and I don't know about you, but I read that, and I'm thinking, well, how else is a businessman supposed to operate? You make plans, and you carry them through. You say, okay, this is what our plan is. We're going to go here. We're going to buy and sell. We're going to do this for this amount of time. And, you know, that, that's how the world works. And you, you think of this plan, and you say, what, what's wrong with this? This, I, I, this is just practical. That's just a businessman doing his business. I mean, what's wrong with planning? What's wrong with being, uh, having a, an agenda and having an idea of how you're going to prosper, how you're going to make things work? Spiros Zodahates, I can't say the guy's name, but he wrote about this. He says, this was the, an age of the founding of cities. And he said, and often when cities were founded, and their founders were looking for citizens to fill that city, he actually would uh, offer citizenship freely to Jews. Because when the Jews came to the city, money and trade followed them. And so the picture here is of these Jewish people. This is written, remember, that those scattered, scattered abroad, and they're saying, okay, where are we going to go? Here's a new city where there's a great trade chance. I'm going to go there. I'll get onto the ground floor. I'll trade for a year or so, and I'll make my fortune, and I'll come back rich. And it sounds reasonable. I mean, you got to have a business plan. you got to have an idea of what you're going to do. you got to have an idea of, of, of how long to do something for. you got to have some idea of what your plan is before you begin. That's what makes sense. So what's wrong with verse 13? It's not what's in there. It's what's not in there. It's that this person is making these plans, but he's not referencing the Lord. He's not going to God and talking to him about it. He's just saying, this is what I'm going to do. As if he's the boss, as if he's in control. And forgetting that he needs to, in all his ways, acknowledge him, and he'll direct his paths. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not unto thine own understanding. The Bible says in that passage, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. And this man, he's just simply, these ones that he's talking to, they're just living their life based on good, sound, I guess, worldly principles or even There's nothing wrong with what they're doing. But they're not thinking of the Lord. And that's the problem. And the Bible reminds us that in every area of our life, we need to acknowledge the Lord. Whether it's at home, whether it's at church, whether it's at work. People say, you know, you can't marry work and religion. The two don't go together. Well, the Bible would beg to differ. For Christians, you're to be a Christian everywhere you go, whether it's at home, whether it's at church, or whether it's in your business. We're Christians and ought to be reflected. Remember what the theme of James is? James is theme, the name of our series, He is Lord. Our theme is the Lordship of Christ. All throughout James, the theme is, If Jesus is really Lord, it ought to affect how you live. And James is here talking to people that are just, they've forgotten that. These ones are just, you know, it's, we we look at them and James is pretty, it seems pretty harsh when you read it. And you think, man, those people, they must have been pretty bad. Yeah, you know what they're probably like? They're probably people just like me and just like you. 
You know, we just go about our lives. We make our plans today. This is what I'm going to do today. This is my plan. This is my plan for tomorrow. This is my plan for next week. This is what my plans are. And your wife says to you, did you pray about that? <laughs> did, did you talk to the Lord about that? Are, are you sure that that's what it is that we ought to do? And I know, I don't know. <laughs> and just people like us. And we need to remember the Lordship of Christ. And even in the things of just making our plans, making our propositions of what we're going to do today or next week or next year, as this person's talking about in the text, we need to make sure that in all our ways, we've acknowledged him. And if they're going to have Jesus as their Lord, you know, I imagine if you have an employee, some of you might have someone that works that you're responsible for that works under you. Well, in that situation, you typically know what that person's doing and you don't want that person to just go off and do their own thing. Well, if Christ is our Lord, don't you think we shouldn't just go off and do our own thing? We should make sure we talk it over with him first. Make sure that what we're doing is according to his will. And so in verse 13, they've forgotten that if Jesus is their Lord, they better run their plans by him first. Better talk it over with the Lord first. Better include him in the decision-making process. Better acknowledge his right to tinker their schedule at his will. You know, maybe it is that these ones, I'm sure some of them have, because the next portion is talking about ye rich men. Maybe they got their eyes on money and off the Lord. Maybe they got their eyes off their business and thought this is what they had to do. And they forgot the most important thing is to serve the Lord. So first of all, they forgot the Lord, the forgotten Lord. And then secondly, their second problem we see in this text is that they had faulty logistics. They're making these plans. They're assembling what they're going to do and saying, this is what's going to happen next, this day and next year and this is how it's going to go. Except there's one thing they forgot. And that's that they really had no idea how it was going to go. Because how did they know what was going to happen tomorrow? Verse 14. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. You're making all these plans for the tomorrow and the next year. And yet you have no idea. No idea what tomorrow is going to bring. The Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for the, the, thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. That's Proverbs 27.1. And we have no idea. You make your plan, and who knows? Maybe it'll be an illness. Maybe there'll be another emergency. Maybe you have these plans, and then the power will go out. Maybe there'll be these plans, and you'll miss the alarm clock. Or maybe there'll be a flat tire. Who knows what it could be? You know, we made plans as a church. We made a few plans. We were pretty adamant about our plans. Some of us didn't want to cancel our plans, regardless of what the weatherman had to say about it. We planned on this first date for our picnic. July, what day was that? July 18th, we were going to have a picnic at Smiley's Park. That was the day of the flooding. Then we planned another day for a picnic. We're going to have the picnic on September 12th, and then there was a hurricane. I don't know if I want to plan another picnic. <laughs> Every time we plan it, something bad happens. But anyways, <laughs> but we make our plans, but we have no idea. We have no idea what the morrow may bring. And it's a reminder to us that we're not the ones in control, are we? We're not the ones on the throne. Jesus is Lord, and he's on the throne, and we need to yield to him. There's a forgotten Lord. Then there's faulty logistics with their plans. And then thirdly, they made these plans without God, forgetting the frailty of life. The frailty of life. In verse 14 again, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow, for what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. 
How foolish it is to make plans without God when your life is so fragile, when your life is so short. There, there this person is making his plan. This is what I'm going to do tomorrow. This is what I'm going to do for the whole next year. And yet, the fact is, he didn't know where he'd be tomorrow. He didn't know where he'd be next year. He wasn't guaranteed to see that. He wasn't guaranteed to live to see his plans come through. And the fact is, none of us are guaranteed that. And that's the point. The Bible tells us in the Old Testament, we just studied the story just before we got to the book of James, of this family, a man named Elimelech, who lived in Bethlehem during a time of famine, and he came up with a very reasonable plan. He said, listen, there's a famine. I'm going to just go and sojourn in the land of Moab. I'm going to go live there for a a year or so. I'm going to go continue there a little while. I'm going to buy and sell there and get gain, and then I'll come back. Except, did he ever come back? Elimelech and Malon and Kilion all died in the land of Moab. Their plan seemed reasonable, but the fact is his life was frail and he didn't realize it. And we plan ahead without God, yet we can't afford to do that. Life is too short. You know, regardless of how long you might, your life might turn out to be, it's still going to be short when you look back over it all. We live our lives as a tale that is told. And everybody that's, uh, that, that's lived a long time will tell you how short life is. James is here using water vapor as an illustration. My boys have just been learning about vapor in school the last few days. They've been learning about solids, liquids, and gas. You know the difference between those three. This is very fascinating. Solids, the molecules are all compact together, and so it keeps its shape, and it's very you know, solid. Liquids, it's a little looser, so it can flow freely, takes the shape of its container. But then gas or vapor, water vapor specifically, but gas, the molecules are all so loose that they are like, you can't keep it. It just, you can't hold it in your hand. I mean, you breathe air out, but you can't see where it goes. It's just gone. The water vapor that comes from the steam is just there for a second, and then it's gone. And where did it go? And James is like, that's your life. It's frail. It's not that solid. It's the vapor. And it goes for a little while and then vanishes away. It goes fast. Uh, Henry Twells writes a poem called Time's Paces. He says, when as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I waxed more bold, time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. When older still I grew, time flew. Soon I shall find in passion on time gone. It flies by. And on top of that, not only is it short, but it's uncertain. You don't know when it's going to be gone. And so James is reminding us then how foolish it is to live our lives without acknowledging God. How foolish it is to not follow his will when we don't, and make these plans when we don't even know what tomorrow may bring. But you know, I just want to say the fact that life is short, he's not just emphasizing how foolish it is to make plans without God. But the fact that life is short, doesn't that tell you how important it is to make sure that today you're living for God? I mean, you're not guaranteed tomorrow to live for God. Lots of people say, you know, I'll live for God later. I'll, I'll settle eternity later. I'll, I'll, I'll get it right later. I'll just wait till I'm a little older. Then I'll yield my life to the Lord. You're not guaranteed later. You have today. Now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Harden not your hearts as in the day of provocation. God wants you to yield to him today. It's senseless to make plans today without God. Then, though, we see secondly, not just the senselessness of it, but secondly, we see the sin, the sin of making our plans without God. Now, if we just say it's senseless and just leave it at that, 
I don't think we get the impact of what's being said here because the fact is we do a lot of senseless things, but we don't feel like we've sinned when we've done some senseless things. You know what I mean? Sometimes you're just being silly and sometimes I guess silliness might have its place. I hope it does because I'm silly more often than I should be. But uh, the other day I was leaving home and I noticed the boys were in the backyard throwing a bat up into the tree or something. And what had happened was they had thrown a ball, Nathan had hit the baseball and it got stuck way up in the tree. So then he decides to take a bat and throw a bat up into the tree to knock the ball down. Then the bat gets stuck in the tree and I come along and I say, Nathan, what are you doing? He explains it to me. And you think that's the opportunity to say, Nathan, that's foolish, don't do that. But no, you know what I did? I got another bat and started throwing that up into the tree. And then I had another bat stuck in the tree. <laughs> so then I finally got a ladder and my hockey stick and I climbed the ladder and knocked the bat, two bats and the baseball out of the tree with my hockey stick. <laughs> but yes, we, we sometimes do foolish things and we just think that was foolish, but we don't think anything more about it. But in this case, God isn't just telling us that making these plans without God is foolish. James is telling us that making these plans without God, it's sin. It's a sin to plan our lives without him. In verse 15, he says, For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boasting. All such rejoicing is evil. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. It's not just senseless, it's sin. And what's the sin? Well, I believe, number one, it's the sin of presumption. We already said you, you, you don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. But when we make our plans without acknowledging the Lord, we're acting as if we do. We're acting as if we know as if it's in our hands, as if we're the ones in control. And really, we need to be acknowledging the Lord, and that's all dependent on his will. Verse 15, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this. Ye ought to. You know, there, there used to be a day, I'm told, <laughs> when people wouldn't do things because they had better do them. They did them simply because they ought to do them. Now, there's a difference. We often don't do things unless we have to do them. But when we have principle, when we live by the word of God, we'll do things just because we ought to do them. You know that the word ought actually occurs 58 times in the New Testament. And it's supposed to be a word that carries a lot of weight. Does it carry weight with you? For something to be, ought to be done, it means it's supposed to be done. It's the right thing to do. It's wrong not to do it. Nobody should have to force you to do what's right. And the text is saying, ye ought to say, if the Lord will. Ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Don't be presumptuous, assuming that you know what will happen tomorrow. You've made your plans, but whether or not they come to be isn't in your hands. Acknowledge God's pardon it. Acknowledge God's rule. Somebody's actually said that being presumptuous is actually a form of worldliness. They say it's a presumptuous confidence in the future, as if the future and all that it brings were in our hands. But that's not how it is. It's in God's hands. And so we ought to say, if the Lord will. It's the sin of presumption, but secondly, it's the sin of pride. Verse 16, but now ye rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. You rejoice in your boastings. You know, in general, there's nothing wrong with rejoicing. Nothing wrong with being rejoicing in something good and something good that's happening or something good that God is doing. And you read this and you say, well, what's wrong with this rejoicing? I just told you my plans, and I'm just telling you that I'm excited about it, telling you what I'm going to do, and that's all, that's all it is. I'm just 
you know, it's like a guy at the beginning of the season tell, talking about the Toronto Blue Jays and how amazing they're going to be. You know, it's just, this is how it's going to be. We're going to win the World Series. Hey, they might make the playoffs. It's a, you know, it's looking like they're on their way there, maybe, if they, uh, if the Lord wills. <laughs> that's, that's what it comes down to, doesn't it? But we make our boasting of our hockey team, make our boasting of our plans, make our boasting of our business, make our boasting of our whatever it might be. And it's not that it's wrong to be excited about these things. It's just, it's wrong to boast about what you're going to do without acknowledgement of the Lord's will, without acknowledging that really it's dependent on what the Lord allows. And James says, this is evil. This is sin. And why is it sin? Because it's boasting about your own strength. It's boasting about your pride. It's boasting about your, uh, about, about self. And it's boasting outside of the Lord. And if, God forbid that I should glory, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. And to, our, to live our lives as if we can do it all on our own, without acknowledging our Lord and Savior, that's a form of pride. Pride wants to be independent of God. Pride wants to live life and forget about God and forget God's will and forget what God wants. Pride and pride, man wants to do it all on his own. But God didn't make us that way. He didn't make us to be independent. He made us dependent. We depend on him. That's why we have a prayer meeting night, because we're acknowledging that we need him. We need his help. And pride would have us forget that and make our plans and try to do it all on our own. It's a sin of presumption. It's the sin of pride. And then finally, it's the sin of omission. I'm sorry, I can't think of a P that says the same thing as omission. It was so close. Uh, now you can write folly instead of senselessness, okay? <laughs> but the sin of omission, because it says in verse 17, therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. When you know it's the right thing to do, and you don't do it, it's sin. And that's pretty basic. That's pretty straightforward. It's not just not doing wrong things. It's making sure you do the right thing, okay? And uh, the trouble is we like to put things off. We like to pr procrastinate. When I was a teenager, I had a t-shirt that said, Slackers Unite tomorrow. <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it's just the way we are. We, we, we like to put things off, at least some of us do. There's a story of a man that was cleaning out his desk one day, and he found a tag from the shoe repair store. And uh, he's like, oh, I, can, I, I forgot to go and get my shoes. It was 10 years old. And he said, well, you know, I have nothing to lose. I might as well go down to the shoe repair store and see what happens. What's the worst that could happen? So he goes down and he has the tag and he shows it to the man. And the man goes in the back to look for his shoes. And after a few minutes later, he comes back, but he doesn't have the shoes with him. The man says, what happened? Did you, did you find the shoes? He said, yes, I did find them, but they won't be ready till Friday. <laughs> <laughs> 10 years wasn't long enough to fix the shoes, apparently. But, um, you know, we love to put things off for tomorrow that we should do today. And people do that with God. They say, let me live today and I'll think about eternity later. Uh, let me do my own thing. Let me live my life. But God says, no, today's the day. Now's the accepted time. And don't you dare think that you can go into the world without acknowledging God and have things all happen your way. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. You got to make him Lord of your life. Surrender your life to him. And the Bible tells us if you don't go to the Lord, that's a sin because you know you need him. You know you're to depend on him. And therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. The sin of presumption, the sin of pride, and the sin of omission.
It's not just senseless, it's sin. But what will it take for you to include God in your plans? You know what it takes? It just takes surrendering to the Lord, surrendering your heart to him. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Just takes presenting your body to him. Just takes submitting to him as Lord and saying, Lord, what do you want me to do? That, we think of Paul as a great Christian. I know that James wrote James, but Paul, we think of him as a great Christian. How did he become such a great Christian? Because the day he got saved, he made a decision and he never went back on it. What was the decision? That he do what the Lord wants him to do. When Jesus spoke to him on the Damascus road, he said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And he did it every day. When he was a missionary, he didn't just go to whatever city he wanted to. He prayed and prayed in Acts 16. You see him fighting. Where should I go? And he waited till the Lord directed him step, his steps. When you read the epistles that he wrote, he's always saying, you know, I want to come see you in Corinth, but if the Lord will. If the Lord will, I'll tarry in Ephesus. If the Lord will, I'll see you here. If I, the Lord will. Everywhere he went was, if the Lord will. And that's how we need to live our lives. It's just by the Lord's will. There was George Whitfield, the great evangelist. Uh, his life was filled with engagements to preach. He was preaching the gospel here, there, and everywhere. And someone asked him what he would do if he knew for certain that the Lord would return in three days. He pulled out his diary and showed the man his schedule and said, that is what I should do. Now listen, we're not all called to preach, but all of us should be living our lives that our plans are the Lord's will, that what we're doing is what he would have us to do, that we're living our life by the Lord's will. Are you living your life in submission to the Lord according to his will? Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this text. Lord, it's such a challenging little portion that reminds us of this most basic principle that we need your direction. I pray, Lord, that we'll follow you and do your will day by day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.